Stay hungry, stay foolish. As always, thanks to our friends at Zai. Zai is a global financial services company specializing in foreign exchange and payments and supporting innovation in all its forms. Check them out at hellozai.com. Structural racism has impacted the lives of African Americans in the United States since before the country's founding. Although the country has made some progress toward a more equal society, political developments in the 21st century have shown that deep divides remain. To bridge our divides, our guest, a renowned political scientist, calls for radical empathy, moving beyond an understanding of others' lives and pain to understand the origin of our biases. We welcome the author of Radical Empathy, Finding a Path to Bridging Racial Divides, Terry Givens. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's so great to have you on the show, Terry. I was telling you before we came on, I, I had I, I got so much value from it in so many different aspects of my life as a as a as a human being, as a parent, as a business person, all those things were so valuable for me. But ultimately, it's the whole idea of making an impact on the planet. And you're definitely doing this. And you begin the book by saying, it's difficult to have empathy in an age of political division. But more than empathy, we require what you call radical empathy. Maybe let's start with sharing what this means versus empathy itself. When I talk about empathy, it's something that we have to practice, but it's also um, not enough. So when I was working on this book, I realized, well, I have empathy for other people. You know, I, I like to be able to you know, put myself in their shoes and imagine what their life is like, but that's not enough. You know, we have compassion, we have empathy, but things don't change. Yeah, I, I guess I saw it in my own neighborhood, in my own life. Well, it's not that people don't care or that they don't have empathy. It's that they have to take action. And so I realized that the, the bigger problem is that not enough of us take action in our day to day lives. Um, and that means thinking about, you know, the others, but also taking action to create change. And one of the big things you talk about in the book is the idea of connecting with your own story. And this was really impactful on me. You say connecting with our stories is an important step towards developing empathy and demonstrating vulnerability, Terry. And you did this with this book, you shared so many stories, and you went on a self exploration as well. And at a time of great division in your country, you turn your researchers lens on to your own story and share that story, starting with the story of your late father, Roy. Perhaps we'll share this and what it meant for you to share this story. My father passed away in 2001, and I opened the book uh, with a story of how we were having a family gathering um, not long before he passed away, and just kind of the pride he had in his family and and so on. And, um, you know, with the, within a couple of weeks of that family gathering, he died from a, a heart attack. And so, one of the things that I do when I, you know, I, this was, of course, a huge uh, uh, impact on my life. And I was had a lot of grief and so on. Um, and, you know, within a few months, I was like, well, I don't understand. You know, he was only 73 years old. Um, you know, why did he die from a heart attack so quickly? And so I started doing research into kind of what are the factors that lead to, to heart attack and risk of heart attack. And I realized one of the, the top you know, factors is being an African-American male makes you more susceptible, not only to have a heart attack, but to die from your first heart attack. And that just didn't make sense to me. Uh, it, it just was kind of crazy that uh, the, the risk factors were so much higher just because you were, were black. And so I started doing more research and that was kind of the genesis of me starting to look more closely into how these structural divide, structural discrimination, uh, you know, and divides lead to these situations where people aren't even getting the healthcare they need. And I was able to connect that to my own story. Um, I, I tell a story, I have a whole chapter on, you know, bias in, in healthcare. And I remember, you know, when I was younger, I, uh, in my twenties, I was having a lot of issues and found out uh, eventually that I had endometriosis, but, you know, I went to doctor after doctor and finally went to one doctor who said, well, I bet you've had a, doc a lot of doctors tell you 
that you couldn't possibly have endometriosis because you're a black woman. <laughs> and I was like, well, I've had a lot of doctors who just didn't believe me. And my older sister had endometriosis and um, he, he was like, yeah, you know, unfortunately we, we tend to, to, you know, um, you know, just tell black women, no, you can't possibly have, so, but he believed me and, and I got the treatment I needed. And, you know, I really believe he saved my fertility. I was able to have two children later on, but those are the kinds of things that you just don't think can possibly happen to you. I was telling my wife about this where I was sharing her the, some of your stories and she was like, on when was this written? Is this 50 years ago? And I was like, Oh no, this is a brand. Isn't, isn't that interesting? I don't know if you've, if you've, got that kind of feedback from people she just didn't understand because and this is the point of of so many of these issues is that they're hiding in plain sight and you say one of the critical issues at the moment in black communities is the health disparities because of the pandemic and it's revealed some of those health disparities that there's a disproportionate amount of the black community dying because of the pandemic maybe we'll share a bit about that terry Absolutely. I was really shocked. Um, I remember reading news story after news story saying how black communities, I remember uh, early on in the, the COVID crisis and the pandemic, um, uh, communities in Milwaukee were very disproportionately hit by COVID and, you know, a lot of misinformation getting out there, but also, um, you know, fear because, uh, for African Americans, there's always kind of this idea, you know, that um, you know, our that we are targeted in, in different ways. Um, you know, there's and you know, and most of us understand that the there was the Tuskegee experiment and so on that um, where black men weren't treated for syphilis for many, many, you know, long time. I mean, and um, you know, so they could watch even though once they had treatment available, they, they've let these men go through and suffer. Um, and, you know, a lot of people know that, you know, that wasn't a, you know, they understand that that was uh, something that um, they shouldn't be afraid to get health care because of it. But we, there's just these disparities. I mean, the, the one of the worst um, uh, things I read about when doing this research into the medical disparities was that um, medical students, you know, a very high percentage of medical students believe black people have thicker skin and therefore we don't feel pain the same way. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of concern at the beginning of the pandemic that the, our, our government at the time, you know, just didn't care about black communities and the impact that COVID was having on them. And so there, and then, you know, just the fact that a lot of these communities um, don't have access to good medical care more, you know, in the U.S., our medical system, you know, it's all based on, you know, for the most part, if you can get insurance through your employer, of course, we have the Affordable Care Act, but um, it's still very difficult to, you know, have the money to get good health care. And then, of course, you have the bias by the doctors and and so on. So the, you know, Black communities, not only in the U.S., but around the world, um, were, uh, you know, I found plenty of data to show that there were disparities in the impact of COVID. Yeah, and I'm just going to share because I, I shared these stats with, with my wife, and these are recent stats. So you mentioned multiple studies in the book, like you just mentioned there, about these health disparities. But this one from the National Part Partnership for Women and Families in the U.S. notes that black women are three to four times more likely to experience a pregnancy related death than a white woman. Black mm -hmm. women are more likely to experience preventable maternal death compared to white women. Black women's heightened risk of pregnancy-related death spans income and education levels. So it's not about income and education levels. But I found that fascinating that you were saying as well that when a black woman or man stumbles upon, if they can get access to a black doctor, their likelihood of getting the correct treatment goes up, which just shows the issues that are, are hiding in plain sight. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the the whole issue of maternal and fetal health outcomes was just so shocking to me. I remember I was I was driving around. Uh, I'd been to a, a meeting in Berkeley or something, and I was listening to our national public radio. 
And um, they were saying how uh, the story came on about how Black women, regardless, as you said, of, of income or education, were more likely to die uh, in childbirth or, or you know, have poor fetal health outcomes. And, you know, I, I had already had my two boys, but I was just shocked by that. And, um, you know, I really, it just, you know, really struck me that, you know, how embedded into the systems, you know, that these things are, that it's not just one doctor, or, oh, well, if we change, you know, this guy's a racist, if we change his mind, then, you know, it'll fix. It's, no, it's embedded into the systems. And, and that's why we all have to take responsibility to change it. You go on to say, for example, in your family, you have experienced lots of health issues, mental health issues as well, which spans across the black community. And it's no wonder when I was reading this, I was talking about the I, I was struck by the amount of of issues that you have to deal with that, are, again, are invisible to people of privilege or people who are fit the system because the system is so tainted. And one of those terms that you talked about is emotional labor. And this is the term that describes the daily work that people of color do as representatives of race or gender. And you are often expected to manage the expectations and issues that others may have with you, including being the spokesperson for an all black people when you're in white spaces. There's so much going on here. And, and I'm sure even coming on to a show like this, there's stuff that you're dealing with that I have no I have no idea that you're dealing with. And that's the point. It, it can be very emotionally heavy. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it's interesting. I was having this discussion with a friend the other day that um you know, I've been in a lot of leadership positions, um, but, you know, I feel like it's, and again, this is, you know, 21st century. And yet in so many of those position, leadership positions I've been in, I'm the first black woman or the first black person or the first woman. And so I, I spend a lot of time, especially when, in, when I'm you know, in universities and so on, often being the only black person in the room or the, you know, whatever it may be. And, um, you know, the, it, it's, it's a burden. <laughs> And, um, yeah, I can't tell you how many times, uh, you know, it's like it, there's this, a lot of people will make a joke about it. Yeah, you're the only black student in the room or whatever. And something about race or, or African-Americans comes up and every head in the room, you know, turns towards you. And so um, I do workshops uh, around the book. And, I, uh, you know, one of the first things I, I tell people is, you know, try not to be that person who you know, is. And uh, I work a lot with my sister who worked in IBM for over 30 years. And she has so many similar stories because, you know, here we are, our generation um, is often, you know, because people are trying to bring more people of color and women into the, the, the these spaces, you know, we're often the first one or the only one in those spaces. And so, yeah, we, we have this you know, it's almost like you're constantly on guard. And the other thing I tell people is just, you know, just in day to day life, you know, if I'm going to go into a store or something like that, I may think, okay, well, I, I have to dress nicely. So people think, you know, I'm an okay person, <laughs> and aren't just going to immediately assume something about me or, um, you know, how do I prepare? It's like you have to, to put on an extra overcoat every time you go outside, because you, you know, you're going to be you know, and even if you aren't that day, you know, you just have to be prepared because you don't want to be caught off guard or, or have to worry, um, you know, about how you're going to respond. So it's this extra layer of burden that, you know, you have when you go into these spaces. And I, I thought about that for those of our listeners who work in high stress, very stressful roles. It's that multiplied by every experience in life, because it, it doesn't it's not just about going to a stressful office environment, it's everywhere, it's in every environment. But there's more and I, I thought this term was really important, Terry, and I'd love you to share it. It's the point about internalized oppression. And you say here, oppression is internalized not only by individuals, but also by families and societies. Exploring the impact of this internalization can explain the impact of racism in a way that can lead to a better understanding of the way that bias has become part of our daily lives. You talk about this even as a child growing up and your parents wanting you to fit into the system and not even having fun, not like you would see children playing in church. That was a no-no for your family because your mother was carrying this emotional burden all the time. Absolutely. And, you know, I talk about respectability politics and, and um, the fact that we, we felt like 
or my mother and father in particular felt like we had to fit into a certain mold. And so, um, you know, and, you know, it's funny, I mean, part of the reason I, I've done a lot of this work and wrote this book is to understand, you know, the choices that my parents made. And so I mentioned uh, the fact that we grew up in Spokane, Washington, which when I was born in 1964 was less than 1% Black. And, you know, my father was in the military, so this was the last place that he was stationed at Fairchild Air Force Base. And so that's where they decided to retire, although he spent a couple of years in Michigan and in between. But, um, you know, it, I, I always had a hard time understanding, why did you choose, you know, Spokane? It wasn't a horrible place, but, you know, it was actually a nice place to grow up for the most part. But it wasn't, you know, we were far from family and, and so on. And, you know, I, I realized over the years that, you know, they understood how important it was going to be for us to be assimilated into white society, that we could function in white society. And, you know, they weren't wrong in many ways. Um, uh, but on the other hand, I felt like a part of myself was suppressed, oppressed or, or just, you know, I couldn't express a, a part of myself. And um, because, you know, you mentioned, you know, being in church, we were not, I always joke that I, I one of my um, ideas was to name this book Growing Up Black and Catholic in Spokane, Washington. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, we're already in a town that's less than 1% Black. And then on top of that, you're Catholic. So, you know, we weren't interacting a lot with people who, who went to the, you know, the quote unquote black church. Um, but, uh, you know, we did interact with some black families that my parents thought were okay, but for the most part, you know, they, they actually did not want us to interact, you know, with a lot of other black people and, um, look down on, on other black people. And I, you know, that had a huge impact on me later on in life because I felt like there was this cognitive dissonance I was struggling with. It's like, well, on the one, I'm black, but you know, you were supposed to act a certain way and be yourself and be confident in who you are. And, you know, that takes me to the, you know, that, that learning to love yourself component. This is really important point. I thought about this. So it's not only your family, for example, were like, we, we need you to fit into this society, but in a way, that meant breaking your breaking your way to Spokane. And then on top of that, it was like turning your back on your own background. And this was really difficult for you. So, and, and it made you curious about what it meant meant to be black in America. And you say that it was clear to you that your Eurocentric school curriculum had left out much of the history that is relevant to your to your family's history. And you learned about you learned nothing about empires in Africa. And that bit you le you did learn about slavery was carefully whitewashed. That is a really important thing. I, I thought about that, about how every history is whitewashed in the education system. And that's how people learn about it. And they take it as read that that's actually what happened. And then in 1977, and this is the power of media, a mini series, which I also saw and I thought was so powerful, w aired and it was called Roots. And this dispelled many of the romantic notions that many Americans and many people across the world had about slavery. This had a huge impact on you. It did. I, I can't. I, it's, it's funny. Um, you know, I, my, it was one of those times my parents are like, OK, you, you can stay up late to watch this and, <laughs> and so on. But um, it really did. I mean, it was the first time I had seen, you know, a portrayal of African-Americans, you know, coming from Africa, you know, being enslaved, uh, you know, kind of how the, the history of that family and, and so on, and, you know, the pride they took in, in knowing their roots. Uh, and so that, that was one of the first times that I felt, you know, and I still love LeVar Burton <laughs> to this day for, for what he did there. Um, but uh, it was one of the first times I, I really felt like I had a connection uh, to that history. And an, another book that really had a huge impact on me was one called Homegoing by uh, Ya Giesi. And that one, um, again, you know, starts in Africa. And it's the first time since Roots that I read something or, or and I hope they turn it into a movie someday, but that I felt that connection to Africa. And I've been lucky to, to have gone to Africa a few times now. And um, you know, really feeling like, yes, that, that feeling that connection through the centuries back to uh, that history. And we, you know, we've been denied that history uh, for, so, for so long. Um, and, 
you know, in our schooling. And so, you know, I actually have another book coming out called The Roots of Racism uh, in the next month. And that one really digs into the history and, you know, within my own field of political science, how we've been disconnected from uh, understanding how these things have come about. And I'm so looking forward to sharing that as well when the time comes. But I, I wanted to lean on to this because it really struck me about that weight of like for anybody, for example, the only thing I could relate to here, and I was looking for my own empathy here to and I, I can't like that's the thing I actually can't get myself into that situation. But the only thing is I moved up from a small country town up to the city when I was a kid. And oftentimes it was awkward for me to go back and visit the family because it was kind of like, oh, no, you know, you're no longer part of the tribe. And I thought about that from your perspective, because you actually went on this mission to find out what it was like to find out about your family later on in life. And you also had that little bit of a kind of a whiplash of, of sorts when you did actually do this initially, but they ultimately welcomed you back with open arms. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, a lot of it was uh, spending just spending some time, uh, you know, learning about where my mother grew up and was raised and, and so on, and um, actually visiting uh, that place. And you know, I'm the family uh, genealogist. So um, I've been working on this stuff, even, you know, even before I started thinking about this book. Back in the 90s, I was uh, really interested in learning more. And of course, now the tools are so much better. Yeah, I can find things like my grandfather's draft card and uh, my parents' marriage license. It's all, you know, digitized now. Uh, but um, yeah, there was was always some, you know, tension there about, you know, and it's funny because I, I, another book that had a huge impact on me is Isabel Wilkerson's The Warmth of Other Sons. And she talks about this issue of how, um, you know, for the older generations, they don't want to talk about, you know, what it was like growing up or, or any of this history. And for me, you know, it was the same thing with, with learning about Black history more generally. Even when I was in elementary, I, I was a huge reader. I read tons of books. And so I would go out and find these books, you know, what, that I wasn't, you know, learning about, and you know, who are the Black heroes and so on. And then um, when I started digging in and, and doing the genealogy and the research on my family history, it really had a, a big impact on me to understand, you know, cert even more recently, like the, I found out that in uh, Opelousas, Louisiana, uh, where my mother was raised in the 1860s, there was this huge massacre. Um, they think over 300 people died and, you know, it was right after uh, the civil war and, um, you know, then I start, you know, digging more and you hear about Rosewood and, and uh, all these other uh, massacres that happened. Um, and it just it's mind blowing that this history just isn't out there. <laughs> and you found you, as you say, on on one of those visits, one of those um, detective visits that you had a relation, of course, you did that was that was massacred in one of these despicable trials where they were actually just trying to stand up for rights. And and I, I think it's really important to recognize those people because they made the ultimate sacrifice for the rest of us going forward. And they're often not recognized because they've gone on to the next place. Yeah, so there's a, a really amazing memorial um, in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, done by Brian Stevenson, who's well known for his, his work and his writings. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's the uh, National Memorial for Peace and Justice, but also known as the, the lynching memorial. And so you go, it's an outdoor space and you go in and there's, uh, for each county in the United States where a lynching has occurred, they have a pillar. And so it's very impactful. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I encourage people to go to their website and uh, of course visit eventually. But, you know, I was just kind of, I was, I did this tour of, uh, you know, places in, you um, uh, Georgia and Alabama, because I know my father's family came from Georgia and, uh, you know, there's all kinds of ties in that region. And so my friend who's a professor at University of Alabama took me to this national memorial and um, I wasn't going there expecting to see, you know, somebody's name that I recognized. I, I was just curious and wanted to see that. Actually, when it first opened, I was, I knew I had to go and see it for some reason. And uh, as we're going through, the thought occurred to me, well, what if I see a name that I recognize? So I looked up the, so in uh, the Louisiana, the, the counties are called parishes. 
And so I looked up, you know, where Opelousas was, and it was in St. Landry Parish. And, you know, we hadn't quite gotten to Louisiana yet. And so we get to that pillar and I look and there's the name Julian Stelly. And my mother's maiden name was Stelly. And it just uh, hit me like, you know, <laughs> this uh, huge wave of just uh, so many different emotions at the same time. And so I looked up uh, Julian Stelling because there are many family members out there have done a lot of the genealogy work. You know, I found he wasn't that he was a very remote cousin, you know, very, very distant, but still, um, you know, a, a member of the family. And there was a news article that I found about what happened. And he was um, basically out, had been out trying to register people to vote. And the Ku Klux Klansmen came with guns and blazing and, um, you know, he was shot and killed. I just wanted to build on that point about the idea of this monument that was plainly visible, because you had the immense opportunity to visit many times Europe, and you've studied intensively in, in Europe. You also speak German and French, and you had time to spend there. And where I thought this was really impactful was what you, the chapters you dedicated to those countries that have experienced these difficult pasts, but don't let them just be glossed over. And in the book, you explore ways to find a positive path forward in a country where people can live and work together while acknowledging the impact of the past. And you share how in both Germany and South Africa, change didn't happen quickly. It took time to move past the pain and damage done during times of oppression and violence in these countries. I thought we'd move on to this, Terry, because here's where we can learn from other countries who are still moving on from the past, because as you say, it doesn't happen quickly. The harm done in South Africa, of course, uh, you, you, it was still very apparent when I went to visit there. Um, and, you know, but it was interesting um, to see also in Germany, you know, with the Holocaust and the, uh, you know, desire to recognize that history and memorialize it in different ways, but also educate about it. I remember when I first went to Germany and um, I was staying in a, a at the University of Constance in a dorm talking to young people. Um, and, you know, they talked about how they felt like they were, you know, constantly being um, asked to think about, you know, they, to, to question everything. <laughs> and, you know, so, of course, Germany went through the Nuremberg trials, you know, after right after World War II. But um, it's been an ongoing process. And I, I was happened to be in Germany in uh, 1995 when, uh, there was a, an exhibit that went around about the Wehrmacht, uh, the German army. And there'd been, you know, even though Germany had been through all of this, there was this kind of, you know, idea that, well, the Wehr Wehrmacht, they were okay. It was just the SS and the Nazis that were bad. But this uh, exhibit, you know, was showing how the Wehrmacht was very much engaged in a lot of the atrocities. And so this was like another reckoning for Germany to come to that, no, you know, you, you know, people want to say, well, my uncle was in the Wehrmacht, but, you know, he wasn't involved in the Holocaust. And, and it just, you know, it wasn't true. And so, um, you know, these things ha made Germany go back and, and again, reflect on, um, you know, what had happened and, and just everyday people who were part of it. Um, and so, yeah, I talk about the Stolperstein, those, those you know, stones that you're supposed to stumble on that, you know, recognize somebody who lived in a home or uh, had a business. And um, so there's the, this constant and, you know, there's, of course, the Holocaust Memorial and, and many Holocaust Memorials. And, you know, I, I actually have never been able to visit one of the former uh, camps um, like uh, Auschwitz or anything like that, because for me, just the emotion, you know, because I have so much empathy, I just feel like the, the emotional pain. But, you know, in South Africa, I did go to Robben Island, uh, where Nelson Mandela was held. And that was also a very impactful experience, because one of the, the guides they use are people who were held there. So it's these kinds of experiences and facing up to the past that I think are so critical. And that's it's something that we here in the U.S., we need to have a process of truth and reconciliation that hasn't happened. Um, and, you know, it's interesting now because I'm working at McGill University in Canada and they're going through a process of truth and reconciliation now with indigenous communities. And, you know, this is, again, another process that we have to look at and say, look, these crimes were committed, but there's very much still a part of our present day, even though they may have happened 50 years ago. 
And so I'm watching these processes and, you know, the, the last chapter of the book is all about truth and reconciliation. And I do believe that um, having some kind of truth and recon reconciliation process here in the U.S. would be so helpful to help us get past um, and you, know, yeah, I mean, you never can get past it, but to at least acknowledge and understand how to this very day, this is impacting every single one of our lives. I thought about this recently that if you think about people who were children during the war, during World War Two, they, they, they're starting to die, you know, they're, they're mostly died out. And when there's no verbal record anymore from somebody to talk about that and talk about the stories and what it was like or if they're great grandparents now and it's like oh no there's your great grandfather tony over there he was he was a kid during the war he saw the germans come into his small town in france and walk through the place they were like machines compared to the french soldiers those kind of stories are dying out and that's why i think this work that you're doing and passing on the record like a baton through the, the different periods of time is so important. We cannot forget about these things. And I thought this was lovely what you talked about that the parents in Germany do. So one of the terms that you mentioned there is weiter gut machen. So to, to make it good again. And I, I thought about this, I was telling you off air that I work with a lot of financial institutions. And it's a similar process to probably like you say, what should have happened on a societal scale in the US about slavery and the atrocities that was ex that happened. The same thing needs to happen on business processes where we talk about them, we don't let them happen again, and we can see there's cracks starting to appear again. And one of the key things you mentioned there briefly was that children are encouraged to speak up against authority, to not just assume that just because somebody in a position of authority says something that it's true. And I thought about what an immense impact that has on the society of children, where they start to question, because that is a superpower in this age where we're so divided. That willingness to question things, um, and to, to teach our children, you know, that, you know, not you know, it's so important because people talk about, you know, how during these, you know, situations where um, these atrocities are happening, um, you know, they're afraid to speak up or, you know, they, they don't want to, you know, create waves. Um, but, you know, it's, it's fascinating because I do see a generation uh, of uh, young people in the U.S., but not just in the U.S., around the world who are stepping up and saying, hey, wait a second. Um, we need to speak up. We need to to make sure that we're we're making uh, you know companies and and you know adults accountable because you know they're they're looking at a, a very uncertain future because of climate change, and um, so it's not just you know racism and and uh, you know various atrocities. It's it's uh, their their actual future is in doubt. And you know you look at the Greta Thunbergs and and others who are really stepping up and and they need to hold us all to account uh, for uh, the past and the things that have happened. And, you know, as you said, you know, the weiter gut machen, we have to really, um, work hard and corporations, banks, everybody, we all have to take, that's why I, I say it's this individual responsibility because it's easy to say, oh, well, you know, IBM or, or, you know, that bank over there, you know, they're the bad people they have to create. No, we're all part of it, you know, and um, there's ways in, uh, you know, every chapter of the book at the end of the chapter, there's a series of steps that people can take because as I said at the beginning, radical empathy is about taking action. It's about actually doing something. And so, you know, it's really critical that people look at those actions and, and actually um, get out and do something versus saying, well, you know, uh, it's up to everybody else, or it's up to these amorphous, you know, people out there, or um, you know, the corporations or government. But we're, those uh, institutions are made up of individuals, so the, every single one of us has to take responsibility and say we're going to do something about it. It reminded me of a, a quote that's always stuck with me by Edmund Burke. I think it was that all that is required for evil to prosper is good men and women do nothing, and. Yeah. And I think that's a, a great thing to inspire in children is to actually be able to say that to them. I tell my children about that, like, don't believe everything you say. I, I lecture also in college, Terry. And one of the first things I tell the 
the child, ki- children, they're teenagers, they're no, they're adults, they're in their 20s. I tell them, just because I'm on the stage here doesn't mean I'm a sage on the stage. I, I couldn't be wrong. I'm imparting information here. What I want to do is actually is kindle the, the ideas within you and you ask questions about them and you build upon them. And I think that's a much better way of, of passing on the baton of knowledge. So it's not it grows, it's, you know, it evolves over time. But if, if you will, I'd love to come back speaking of education to your experience, because I thought about the different tracks here. So if you think about all the emotional burden that you had to deal with, there was being a woman in leadership position anyway, then there was being a black woman in, in leadership position. And then there was actually being a pioneer. And as we know, the pioneers take the arrows. And you I'm sure have got many arrow <laughs> scars. And I thought we'd share some of them because many of our listeners are leaders and they're women leaders and they experience some of the things that you experience. And I thought maybe we'd share your experience in academics because you plowed uh, your own furrow in academics and you've done extremely well, but it wasn't without its challenges. Absolutely. You mentioned the the slings and arrows, you know, but when I left the University of Texas at Austin, um, you know, I felt like I had knives and and swords and all. I felt like I was walking around and my back was clanking because of all the (laughs) the knives and swords and things I had in my back. But, um, you know, I mean, on the one hand, I feel very lucky because I had some very good mentors who helped me to get into those leadership positions and people. Yeah, I say one of the things that was really impactful for me is that throughout my career, I had people who saw more in me than I saw in myself, who could see that I had leadership capacity. And so, um, you know, early in my academic career, I, you know, when I moved, I was started out at University of Washington and then we moved to Austin, Texas, and I was at the University of Texas at Austin. And, you know, almost immediately people approached me and said, hey, we've been thinking about starting a center for European studies. Is this something you'd be interested in working on? And so I did that and, and you know, became the director of the center. Um, and then as soon as I got tenure, I, I, I t- always have to tell this story because <laughs> I still, um, to this day, is find it astonishing. But, you know, I was, when we were having a transition in the administration and the um, one day the provost called me into his office as early in the academic year and, and um, you know, offered me the job of, of vice provost uh, for undergraduate education. And I still tell, I tell people, I looked in the, I look in at that office for the dent in the floor where my jaw hit. <laughs> so, um, cause I was so surprised to be, you know, offered this very high level position so early in my career. And um, I did take the job and, you know, did that for three years. And it was like drinking from a fire hose because I was new to this, that level of administration, but also was, was fairly successful in it. Um, I can go through, I have a long list of of accomplishments, including, you know, starting to, besides starting the uh, European studies major, when I was a center director, we started uh, international relations and global studies major. Anyway, we did a lot. And so I took on the, not only did I do undergraduate education, but I took on the international portfolio as well. But, you know, there were people who didn't like the fact, I mean, it's interesting, you know, from one day you know, to the next, from you know being a regular faculty or member and center director to becoming a vice provost, you know there was a sudden chill, you know, in my department. It's like, oh, you know, <laughs> Terry's a, a vice provost now, and you know my department chair is like, wow, you know, you outrank me now, and it's like, well, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and uh, um, and I did have a lot of support in, uh, initially in uh, the broader uh, you know administration, but you know I could see over time that. Because you know, I'm not. I I don't have any problem speaking truth to power. I you know my integrity is very important to me. And you know I was calling some people out for things they were doing that weren't appropriate. And um, you know there was so there was a lot of uh, you know people kind of. I mean I would hear stories. You know I wasn't. I didn't go to the vice uh, presidential gatherings because I, I was you know that was the provost job and you know I would hear stories about people saying things about me in these meetings and and so and, you know and the provost was very supportive of course but you know in particular some people who um were problematic that weren't really doing their job didn't like the fact that I was pointing it out <laughs> and um but just in general uh 
you know, there was I, as the one story I tell is that in the 12 years I was at the University of Texas at Austin, when especially when I started out as the vice provost, there are nine African American women in leadership positions. And by the time I left, there was one. And so there was just these pressures and, and people who, you know, were, were basically kind of protecting their own fiefdoms and, and the process, you know, damaging others. And, you know, I eventually, you know, the main reason I left in, after three years was because I knew I had to get promoted to full professor. But I also just, you know, things at UT just kind of fell apart. Um, and, uh, you know, I felt like I wasn't getting a lot of the support I needed. And, you know, uh, anyway, I could go on and on. But um, the main point being that, you know, when you're, you know, I was the first black woman vice provost at UT Austin and, um, you know, it was a, a, a position, you know, that people uh, for the most part supported, but there was also a lot of people who didn't like the fact that I was, you know, promoted so quickly and, and so on and so forth. And, and so it was, you know, it was really hard. And actually I was the by a large amount, the lowest paid um, of the vice provosts and, and so on and so forth. It's funny, my assistant, our, all our salaries are public. And I, you know, I hadn't looked at our salaries and, you know, my assistant says, do you know that you're making like $60,000 a year less than the next lowest paid? And I'm like, wow, I know I didn't know that. <laughs> so, that and it's so make funny because it no, it doesn't. But it, it was funny. They, they right before I started the position, they had just done this, you know, gender equity um, study and found that, you know, women faculty were, were, you know, massively underpaid compared to male faculty. And of course, we didn't get the endowed chairs and things like that. So yeah, it, it was it was very interesting. Yeah, and, and that, you know, again, th this needs to be shared, this needs to be put out there. And, and also goes for blackmail CEOs, you, you talked about this, for example, if you look at the companies running the, the CEOs running con the, the biggest country companies in the world, and re leading countries, many of them aren't black males. For black women and, and black male men, you know, the and even when it comes to you, know, I, I, I lived in Silicon Valley for many years. And, um, you know, the the venture capital just is not flowing. I mean, it's for uh, women, it's like, what, I think 3% of all venture capital goes to women. And it's like a fraction, a tiny, tiny fraction of that goes to black women. Um, and so they're doing a lot of work to try to remediate that. But, you know, it's still, it's impossible for black women to get venture capital or funding, um, you know, for their uh, organizations. And, and then, of course, the CEO, you know, the top 500 CEOs, you know, there's maybe one or two <laughs> old black men or women. I mean, we just haven't made a lot of progress in those areas. And, and I guess there's a little bit, Terry, as well, where, you know, you know, if you can look, it's kind of like the Roger Bannister effect, you know, the whole idea of if, if I can see it's possible, I can follow in those footsteps. But then there's, a, there's also the problem of the history that it hasn't historically happened. So we're in this kind of holding period. And one of the things that often comes up as well, yeah, you, you can't force equality of outcome, but you can force equality of opportunity. And that's actually what we're pushing for here. Exactly that, um, you know, there, there's so much discussion about, you know, equal opportunity and so on, but we have to go, that's again, we have to be more radical and go beyond that and say, no, we're going to have to lift people up in a way that uh, allows them to even, you know, it's so funny, we talk about an even playing field, Well, we aren't even on the playing field, we're, we're not even close to being on the playing field. Um, because of the historical impacts of things like redlining, um, you know, you, you, you know, what the, the easiest thing people can do is just walk around your neighborhood and so ask yourself who's not there and why. So I can walk around my neighborhood and say, okay, I don't see very many other black people or brown people or anybody. Why is that? Because throughout our history, we've had what's called redlining where these, you know, black people and, and people, even Asians in, in California couldn't buy homes in particular neighborhoods. And so they didn't get access to the same schools. They didn't get access to the same jobs. You know, they didn't get access to all these things. And it's like, you, know, you can't tell people go pull yourself up by your own bootstraps when there are no bootstraps. You know, they're actually, it's, it's very actively engaged, keeping them out of, you know, the, the, the jobs and the homes and the education system. And so, um, 
you know, there has to be, you know, I use the word intentional a lot. We have to be intentional. We have to say, we're going to, you know, make this school better. We're going to make sure these kids are, you know, getting food and, and, and what they need to thrive. Um, you know, we, that they're getting the health care that they need, that we're, you know, training doctors to, to understand the needs of, you know, not only the adults, but the children and, and so on. And so it's, it's, that's why it's so systemic, right? It's all these things, um, you know, are, are playing against what, uh, you know, the outcomes that we want. We say we want these outcomes. And yet, you know, you look at the fact that, you know, schools have been desegregated since the night, you know, theoretically since the 1950s, but if anything, they're becoming more and more segregated because of things like, you know, the housing crises and, and so on. And, you know, when the, the, you know, the financial crisis happened, um, you know, all these bad loans being made, you know, and of course people of color uh, were, hit by this the hardest, you know, losing their homes in greater numbers. And so, you know, there's, there's just these systemic things we have to look at and say, how do we, you know, start from the ground level and make it a, a better situation? You know, by the time these kids are in high school or, or adults, it's it's too late for many of them. We have to really start when people are, are young and, and start with the parents and, and work on this from, you know, to, 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 to get rid of systemic discrimination, we have to work at it systematically. Yeah, and, and one of the w big concerns I have for the future, Terry, as well, to even increase that gap is automation and artificial intelligence taking jobs. And th those first jobs are going to go or those uh, the bottom rung jobs, which they are, unfortunately. And, and that's a huge tidal wave that's on its way. But but if you, if you would, I'd love to go back in time a little bit to your own experience in school, because one of the things I thought was interesting was this kind of duality that you lived in, that you were aware of yourself being a black woman in acad academia, but also you had to, you made these choices because of the way you were raised to actually almost go, well, I better stick with these people who aren't of the black community because actually that's what the way I was, I was, I was, my parents raised me that way. And, you know, an example you give is when you go into the school dorm in Stanford and you have a choice, do I join this black community? Do I sit down with the other black kids and have lunch or do I not? Yeah. And <clears throat> there's, there's a famous book, you know, why do the black kids sit together in the cafeteria? Um, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, the, the structures they need and, and, you know, the, you know, and that's a, a long story, but uh, for me personally, yeah, at, you know, I arrived at Stanford and, you know, I, I just didn't have the uh, understanding of, you know, how these things had impacted me over time. And, you know, I would see, you know, uh, the, first of all was just choosing a dorm mate. Um, not that we got to choose, but that, you, you know, you get a little card that, you know, you wrote down your interest, you know, this was back in the, the early eighties. So we didn't have computer matching yet, but um, you know, one of the questions was, you know, do you want a black roommate? And I was like, well, I don't think I need a black roommate. I, you know, I, I'm comfortable being with a, whoever. And so I, I didn't check that box, but I, you know, it was obvious these, these two girls who lived down the hall from me did. And, you know, they, but, and, you know, not that they didn't inter interact at all with the rest of us in the dorm, but it was very clear, you know, they were, you know, the two black girls in, in their dorm room and they would go hang out with these other black guys and who were, um, roommates in a, a, across the way. And, um, you know, they would sit together all the time at, at lunch and dinner and so on. And, and, you know, it, but I wasn't alone in that. There were several other black students um, who in, were in our dorm and we were, you know, we would just intermix with, with everybody. Um, but, you know, it was hard for me to understand, you know, I was on the track team and a, a couple of the guys were, were also on the track team and, you know, we interacted fine there, but, um, you know, there was still like this barrier um, and you know, it, it really hit me my senior year and I finally started to understand. Yeah. It's okay. You know, Cause I felt a certain, you know, angst or guilt or whatever, you know, and I realized, no, it's okay. You know, you, you just have to be who you are and just be open to everybody. And, um, no, you don't have to go sit you know, with those other kids. Yeah. You know, obviously I didn't, but, um, you know, to take the pressure off of myself, um, and just be who I am. That really impacted me. That piece. I was just putting myself in in your shoes, and I was going to go Whoa, like the 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 dilemma of those moments, you know. And uh, 
yeah, as you said, the angst that that's there, it's not quite guilt, but just this constant buzzing fridge in the back of your amygdala, you know, so this kind of idea that it's just draining, it's draining. And, and as you said, this is one of the reasons you see so many mental health issues in the black community as well, because you're living with that all the time. But yeah. but one of the things you said also there, you, you mentioned how you did track and you were a highly accomplished athlete, athlete but you didn't go down that track, you, you did benefit from it but you didn't actually go down that full scholarship route to become like, you know, an Olympian or anything like that. But you talked about how many of the black community have that expectation on them and it's their way out. And I, it's funny, I, I never thought about the pressure that must put on a community to go, well, not only do th does this kid have to achieve, but then they actually have to provide for a whole family that haven't made it. It's almost like, you know, one of the horses won the race, and that horse can provide for everybody else. And then if they don't make it, the the mental issues of that, so the breakdown that people have when they don't or they get premature injuries, all this must have a huge impact on these families. And, you know, there's a lot of investment um, that's put into often, you know, these, these kids becoming athletes, um, you know, and it's not to, the interesting thing to me is not just the black in the black community. I have friends who, you know, spend years in little league and, um, you know, hoping their kids will, will make it into, you know, just to get a, a college scholarship. Um, and I have friends, you know, I know lots of people whose kids have done that, you know, they, they, maybe they went to a better school than they might have because, or they got a scholarship because, you know, they, they were, did well in, in track. And I did not have a, a track scholarship. Actually, I was just, I was recruited by the coach. So, um, so it wasn't that I wasn't recruited, but at that time, they just didn't have a lot of scholarships. And so I didn't get one. And actually, I was glad uh, that I didn't have a scholarship because it meant I didn't have the you know requirement to stay on the team to keep my scholar. I had a, a academic scholarship at, at Stanford. But um, uh, I, uh, you know, I noticed that a, a lot of you know, people, um, you know, especially after I got out of college, as they were having their kids, you know, they would put their kids into special, pro you know, and this is another, you know, inequity, right? It's like, you think of the sports that, you know, actually, I can't wait to watch the movie about the, um, I think it's King William, about the Williams sisters father, because, you know, he created a program, you know, that he was his daughters, you know, were going to be, uh, you know, pro tennis players. And, um, but in any case, you know, there's this real uh, imbalance in terms of, you know, being, you know, I see it, uh, you know, in terms of like just playing soccer, you know, my boys, you know, grew up playing soccer, but, you know, we had to pay for it because it wasn't in the schools and, and so on, but people really invest a lot of times into um, sports versus, you know, focusing on education or they're, you know, not that they don't care about education. They absolutely do. And, you know, they want their, because you have to get good grades or at least, you know, be passing your classes to be an athlete. Although sometimes that doesn't work as well. Um, but anyway, it's a very complicated situation because, you know, I know my brothers probably weren't pushed as hard in school as they could have been because they were, they were the star athletes. And so oftentimes these star athletes kind of get pushed through school and, and don't get the education they need to. So there's all these different factors that play into it, but you know, there's this expectation um, in certain sports, especially uh, football and <clears throat> excuse me, basketball and uh, you know other sports where um, you know these these kids are seen as having an advantage or <clears throat> that they're you know better athletes. And you know, track is one of those, especially sprinting and things like that. And so you you kind of get put into a box of, uh, you know, being better at certain sports. And, um, but yeah, there's like this machine that, that comes into play, uh, that really is pushing these people to be, um, you know, focus on athletics and, um, but there's no guarantees, right. Um, that you can get an injury and, or, or anything like that. And so that's why I really, you know, my boys are involved in sports, but that was never the focal point of their lives. They, they was always, okay, school comes first and, and sports comes second. And um, it's about finding that balance um, and understanding that, you know, very, very few people make it into the NBA or the NFL or, you know, pro baseball, whatever it is. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, there's got to be a certain balance there, but also it's important that we give opportunity to kids so that they can 
find if, you know, maybe tennis is their sport or soccer or whatever it may be. And, you know, especially here in the U S it's, it's become a class related thing again, you know, of course class and race are very much intertwined. So a lot of sports, you know, black kids just don't have access to. And I thought about that, Terry, from the perspective of the, say you had a kid who was naturally gifted at sports, but it wasn't didn't fulfill them. But they had to kind of go through it. They had this huge expectation, this huge pressure from the family. And that also has its issues as well. I'm sure that's happened to many, many of oh, yeah. the top players out there. But if you were comfortable with it, because you do this in the book brilliantly sharing the stories and the sh stories reveal empathy. I thought about uh, an experience I had. I mentioned to you in my notes that I dated a black French girl, and it was in the early noughties. And Ireland would see itself as quite a progressive culture. But but it definitely wasn't because when I went and you know, went for coffee or whatever for a drink, I would feel people kind of look to one and then the other and kind of just then almost like look down. And it was like a moment of kind of going, huh, you know, and, and I, I was aware of that. And then it, it, what it made me aware was like, if I'm aware of that, she must be aware of that all the time then and, and how how that how hurtful that must be to have to again, wear that emotional burden that I, I thought you mentioned all the you know, the different uh, weapons stuck in your back, but but it's almost like that of an emotional weight that's that's weighing you down all the time. And you've experienced this in your own life, because you have you also have a this experience in your life where you dated a white man, you went through this entire experience. And then there's the expectations in your family, his family, etc. Huge emotional burden there. Yeah, it, it's interesting because, um, you know, what well, when I was growing up um, in high school, you, you know, I was one of nine black kids in, in my school. And uh, so when it came to dating, I would just, you know, I wanted I loved dances. I would go to all the dances. So sometimes I would just ask a, a guy, usually a white guy to go with me. Um, and so when I got into my 20s, I was like, well, you know, I'm going to be like my sisters and just date black guys. But that didn't go very well for I won't get into all that. I talk about it in the book. But, you know, eventually my, um, you know, my now husband and I started dating. And, uh, you know, I mean, just the, you know, we talk about microaggressions, you know, we would be together. And um, I I'll always remember this one. We were we hadn't weren't even married yet, but uh, this guy, a black guy, walks by and says, "You know, God's going to punish you for interracial marriage." And I was just like, "Oh, well, we're not married," <laughs> so we were kind of laughing to ourselves. You know, it's like, "Well, maybe he's probably going to punish us more because we're not even married." But um, in any case, you know, and just you know, the seeing the dirty looks and and uh, um, you know, people making comments and and so on, and um, you know, it, it's interesting because you know we we rose above all of that, but. Uh, you know, but that's the thing. It's like, we have to rise above it. It's like, you can't just be a normal boyfriend, girlfriend, right? It's, it's all these, you know, and Mike's parents have always been very nice and kind. And, but, you know, I remember one time there had been a, um, a murder of a, a, a black man and a white woman. And they were worried, oh, are you guys going to have issues around that? It's like, well, no, yeah, we live in California at the time we were in California and we weren't too worried about it, but um you know, and even for, uh, you know, my parents were very supportive by that point in time. But I remember when my older sister started dating white men, you know, they, they weren't happy about that. And um, by the time I came, I'm the youngest of seven. So by the time I came along, I was like, okay, you know, it's okay if you, you, you know, date whoever you want, but just, you know, as long as you're happy. And, um, but, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, interracial marriage, I have a whole set of statistics about that in the book, because it's still, you know, very difficult. And people, you know, look askance at interracial marriages, and, and so on. And, um, you know, it's becoming more common, but, uh, you know, this is such a complicated issue, you know, for black women, and, um, you know, being the rate of marriage, and so on. It's just really frustrating to see that these issues are still out there. And then, as you say in the book as well, then you have to make your children aware of that, that, uh, you know, this is, this is society, society doesn't, isn't equal in this respect. And they need to understand this, because they're, they're, they're going to be born into this, and they're going to experience it, and they're going to experience s certain issues over their lifetime as well. So you have to deal with that as well. Yeah. Um, and but also setting an example for them. Um, 
and you know making sure they understood you know it doesn't matter you know you're you actually trying to pass on, you know, the wisdom I gained over the years so that they didn't feel these tensions. And unfortunately, they, you know, they, they still do to a certain extent. I remember having a discussion with my son when he started high school and, you know, how he felt like he, you know, he didn't understand the jokes some of the kids from, you know, another part of town were making. And so and I said, well, look, they, you know, that's normal, right? Um, you you're li- you live in a very different part of town than they do, and you know they plus they've grown up together, and you're new. He, this is, we had just moved to the San Francisco area from Texas, and um, so you know helping him understand. And but you know we we talk we end up talking a lot about they still deal with a lot of microaggressions with their friends and and things like that, and and so we we talk about it. Uh, and then of course there's the talk that black parents have to give to their their young men, which is especially while you children in general about the police, right? That, you know, if you ever get pulled over by the police, you know, don't fight back, just, you know, make sure you have your hands on the wheel and they can see you, you know, and, and it's just, and, and actually there's another story I tell about, you know, just um, my boys, you know, they were typical boys. They wanted play guns when they were growing up. And I t- said, no, because I don't trust you can't run around with those. Um, and um, so one day my husband took them to the sporting goods store to get shoes or something. And they talked him into getting a, you know, this play rifle. And, um, you know, I had the orange tip and everything. And I said, okay, you cannot play, you can play with it in the backyard, but you cannot be anywhere in public with this. And not, not long after that, um, Tammy Rice, who was, you know, 12 years old, was in a park playing with a toy gun and was, you know, didn't even get a chance, was shot by the police. And, you know, I had to say, look, I'm sorry, this is why I told you, you cannot go in the front yard and, and play with this gun. Um, and actually that gun eventually disappeared <laughs> um, uh, because this is what happens. And I can't be assured that, you know, the police in this, you know, Austin, Texas are, are going to look at that and see it as a real, you know, anyway, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. It can be a cell phone. It can be anything. And they see it in your hand and, the, you know, you're, you're shot and dead. So, uh, you know, that's, that was really hard as well. At the end of each chapter, the book is brilliantly written. It shares exercises that we can all take. And the first step we can take is with ourselves. And I just wanted to share, Terry, I'm not sure if you're, I know you love France and you love traveling around France. There's a beautiful quote by French essayist, novelist and critic Marcel Proust. And it goes as follows. The only true voyage of discovery would be not to visit strange lands, but to possess others' eyes, to behold the universe through the eyes of another, of a hundred others, to behold the hundred universes that each of them beholds, that is each of them. I thought that was a beautiful quote to bring to life the idea of empathy and trying the very best you can to see it the way the other person can, which is so difficult. But you tell us getting to radical empathy is a path that you have separated into six distinct steps. I thought we'd share this as a final message to our audience. As I was thinking through what radical empathy meant to me, I kind of went through, you know, through my own process of discovery. And the first was that willingness to be vulnerable, because in being vulnerable, I was able to look at my family history and the way I was raised and so on that helped me connect more to my parents and to be more compassionate and understanding about what they had gone through in their lives and the way they had raised us. And so, and then that second step is becoming grounded in who you are, because as I mentioned, you know, going through college, you know, by the time I got to my senior is like, oh yeah, I can just be who I am. I don't have to meet the expectations of the kids, the black kids sitting at the table or, you know, the white kids sitting over here. I can be who, who I am. And so once I became grounded in who I was, then I just felt so much more freedom just to be who I am in the world. But that also allowed me to be open to the experiences of others. So by understanding who I am and, you know, learning to love myself, you know, there's that great Whitney Houston song, you know, the greatest love of all. Um, It actually allowed me to be open to others' experiences. And I also believe that um, if you love yourself, you're, it's much easier to love somebody else because you, you have to know that you are capable of being loved and, and loving others. And so it, opening yourself to the, up to the experiences of others is really critical in this because it's, that's where you, you start to practice empathy. And of course, practicing empathy is the next step. 
because empathy comes natural to some of us, but not to others. And even for me, I feel like I ha- I've always had a lot of empathy, but I have to practice all the time. Um, I am not, you know, above, you know, having issues with, be, you know, putting myself in somebody else's shoes, but you have to go beyond just putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. You have to be willing to take action. And so, um, you know, and like as you said, you know, every chapter of the book has actions that you can take. And then step six is creating change and building trust. And that's where that chapter on truth and reconciliation comes in, you know, talking about ways we can create change that starts, you know, in our neighborhoods and our workplaces and so on, but builds out to our broader societies and says we have to create change in order for everybody to have opportunity and to be in a position to, um, you know, have you know, a good life in the end. I love that you mentioned Whitney Houston. I, I always think about the groundbreaking work she did. And it's no wonder she had problems because mm-hmm. um, the amount of burden that she would have had to carry that none of us will ever know because she held mm-hmm. it to herself as well is, is just incredible. But Terry, I'm, I have a, I've pulled a, a beautiful final quote from the book to share. But before I share that, I, I wondered, where can people find out more about your book, about this book, about your future books, about your writings? Where can they find you? I'm pretty much everywhere, but if you Google Terry Givens, um, you'll find me. But um, uh, if you go to terrygivens.com, I have a page on radical empathy, and I need to get it on in gear and uh, uh, create a new page for the book that's coming out next month, uh, the, the Roots of Racism. Um, I have my uh, faculty page at McGill, um, and so there's very, you know, I have various pages if you just Google and search, but um, terrygibbons.com is the main one, and then I have my company as well, um, Brighter Professional Development, um, where we are offering workshops, uh, and they're very customized. We've worked with several organizations over the years. I've done talks for salesforce.org, and um, salesforce.com as well. Um, I, I've worked with various companies um, and many high institutions of higher education. I'm being asked to do talks all the time. And actually, I got to get my act together and make sure I'm, I've got my schedule for the spring all, all lined up. But um, yeah, I, I'm out there and on social media, um, Twitter at Terry Givens and, and Facebook and so on. So and LinkedIn is a really good place to connect. <laughs> Brilliant, Terry. Well, I'll share that. And it's Terry with an I. So just for yes. those people, are, and I will I will share where to find you. I'm going to quote this and then I'll ask you maybe to close today's show with your message for our audience that is a global audience, Terry. So the quote I picked first is a quote that you share from Nelson Mandela because his words inspired you to focus on the idea of empathy as a way to do this work to appeal to all who have a willingness to remake any country, including your country, America. He said, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught how to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than it is the opposite. Then your words resonated even further, which came after that. And you said, we may not agree with our neighbor, but you hope our love for our communities can help us find a path to move past hate. We must start using our tools and techniques like those described in this book to create hope and energize us for the long haul of healing the racial divisions in our societies. There is no miracle cure and a new leader can change the tone but it will take all of us working together to shift the tide. Each of us has the capacity to implement these strategies at every level. It can be a conversation with your neighbor in the workplace or in your local cafe. These tools are applicable everywhere. What about you, Terry? What's your final message for our audience today? One thing we haven't talked about is, is just this idea of having courage because, you know, we, we mentioned fear. I mean, a lot of times we're afraid to take that action be, for whatever reason it may be. And I, I often see this happening in the, these workshops when mostly, you know, maybe a group of white people I'm talking to and, you know, they might have one or two black colleagues in the room and they're literally afraid to speak up because it's like they're afraid of making mistakes. So the one thing I will say is that you have to have the courage. Maybe you will make mistakes at the beginning but have the courage to make those mistakes and learn from them, right? We're all, every single one of us makes mistakes. So if you get paralyzed with fear, then you're just not going to take any action. So it's really important that we understand 
that you have to have that courage to, to make mistakes because we all learn from them. Beautiful way to finish today's show. Author of Radical Empathy, Finding a Path to Bridging Racial Divides, Terry Givens. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And as always, thanks to our friends at Zai, at Global Fintech, innovating within their area of expertise, friends of the show. By supporting them, you're supporting us. Check them out at hellozai.com. 